So um, this is a, a little bit of a hybrid presentation that draws uh, on my uh, book on St. Louis, um, but based on recent work, some of it at ACLU, what I sort of do is recenter that uh, on Ferguson and uh, try and explain the sort of trajectory, development, demographic of Ferguson um, up to last August when uh, Michael Brown was shot. I think you know a lot of people, uh, and I certainly know from my conversations with the press, were a little bit uh, taken aback or, in a sense, confused by the location of um, of the unrest last summer, uh, and often inaccurately, I think, described Ferguson as a suburb. Um, I think it's a very uh, as plays a particular as a particular sort of spatial and demographic uh, niche in the history of St. Louis as a sort of struggling inner suburb uh, and as a, as a zone of racial transition, as I'll talk about. Um, but I think in order to tell that story, we need to start with the sort of larger pattern, um, which is the, the, the gist of my book on St. Louis, which is a story of systematic uh, racial segregation in the city. Um, and that begins in 1916. Uh, St. Louis was one of a number of cities, mostly border cities, Louisville and Baltimore did it as well, uh, to try and pass, um, and actually did pass, a racial zoning ordinance. So this is... Uh, Ten years before American cities really constitutionally have the right to zone uh, under the Constitution. And St. Louis proposed uh, in 1916 and passed by popular referendum uh, this zoning ordinance, which marked off these blocks of the city in the Central Business District and in the older African American neighborhood as the only places in which African Americans could live. Uh, the Supreme Court struck this down in 1917 in the Buchanan versus Worley case. And so the local real estate industry followed up by establishing their own set of restrictions on pretty much the same footprint. Uh, this was the unrestricted zone established by the real estate exchange. And it meant if you were a real estate agent or a landlord uh, in um, the city, you could rent or sell to an African American on that footprint, but nowhere else. This is expanded in 1940 to cover a slightly larger footprint, which corresponds very closely with the reach of race-restrictive deed covenants that spread across the city. Now these are um, agreements of neighborhood restriction that are either on the original deed of properties, as I'll, sh as I'll show in a moment, or in the case of North St. Louis, they're put together by the real estate industry by going door to door and getting neighbors to sign up. And so what the yellow swath there represents, particularly the sort of ragged horseshoe in the north part of the city, are about 380 separate agreements uh, in the city. They're fairly small scale. Under Missouri law, as you're going door to door getting signatories, if you didn't have more than 75%, it wasn't a valid agreement. So you would go file at the city hall, cross the street, and start doing another one. And they looked like this. So it's a little map of the neighborhood. And then the boilerplate agreement in uh, St. Louis generally had two restrictions. One was, that you shall not uh, erect a rag-picking establishment or a glue factory on your property. And the second was, the second offensive use of property was allowing it to be occupied by African Americans. So the stead restrictions shall include a restriction against selling, conveying, leasing, or renting to a Negro or Negroes, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the agreements in St. Louis uh, had three parties to the agreement, uh, the buyer, the seller, and, and bound the buyer of the property in any succeeders in ownership. And the third party, and the one that always brought suit if they were violated, was the real estate exchange. Because in fact, what we see in St. Louis, particularly in the 1930s, is these agreements are violated by white homeowners who want out from under them because they want to get out of the city. But their parents or the, uh, the previous owner signed one of these agreements, which lasts for 25 years, and so they couldn't do so. So in the city, Again, it looks somewhat like this. So the ones in the north side are assembled to sort of surround the African-American neighborhood, prevent it from expanding. The ones you see on the south side are mostly original to the deeds. That's newer development in the south part of the city. And as importantly, they're absolutely ubiquitous in the county. So all of the new suburban development that spreads west of the city into the cornfields has these original to the subdivision plans. And these are all, in fact, advertised and marketed as protected or restricted properties. And that's what it meant. They had these covenants attached to them. The, 
The Shelley versus Kramer case, which begins in North St. Louis in the mid-1940s, eventually outlaws enforcement of race-restrictive deed covenants in 1947. Uh, so you're still allowed to have such a covenant, but the state can no longer enforce them. The importance of these, of these agreements after 1947, or before and after 1947, really, in my mind, is not so much the agreements themselves, but how they live on in other forms, in other forms of public policy. The first of those is the effort by the New Deal to uh, rate uh, properties for subsidized mortgages or insured mortgages in the 1930s and 1940s. So for those of you who are not familiar with this story, the, the New Deal in trying to uh, buttress the home building industry in, the, in response to the Great Depression establishes the terms of the modern home mortgage. So instead of putting down half of the money and paying it off in five years, you can put down 5% and pay it off in 30 years. But in order to get banks to go along with that, the federal government had to say, well, we'll insure your risk. The key to insuring that risk was the federal government going into cities like St. Louis and raiding the properties from good to bad. Because the federal government, as with many New Deal agencies, didn't have the capacity to do that itself, it went into a city like St. Louis and said, who knows the value of property? And the real estate exchange said, well, we, we do. And we'll rate the neighborhoods. So even more instructive than the maps that you see like this, which and there's one of these for every major American city, are the sort of original clipboards that you can find in the National Archives where people walked around the neighborhood rating properties. There was a, the first checkbox on it was Negro occupancy. And so that knocked it to a yellow or a red zone. But you also see these elaborate narrative descriptions of these neighborhoods where they say, oh, it's beautiful houses, it's middle class housing, everyone seems to have a job. But, and the, and the two buts in this case were, there's African Americans living here, or the race restrictive deed covenant will expire within five years, in which case we're not going to insure mortgages in this neighborhood, or we'll rate it and in any way downgrade it. What recent researchers have found is if you actually map insured mortgages onto this, the red and the yellow zones did not restrict lending, but they changed the terms. So uh, insurance rates were higher um, and uh, interest rates were higher in the red and the yellow zones. And that looks black and yellow, and is the black? Yeah, the black is red. Okay. The, the uh, projector's not going <coughs> to Okay. The spirit of these older race restrictive agreements also lives on in zoning. And one of the um, centerpieces of my research on St. Louis is looking in, in fact at what happens in zoning outside the city. And under normal circumstances, you know, St. Louis County has 94 incorporated municipalities in it. And under, as a historical project, normally you'd have no idea what's going on in them because they don't keep records, they don't have a city clerk, they don't have archives. But the largest urban planning firm in the country, Harlem Bartholomew and Associates, is a St. Louis firm. And all of these municipalities went to them to write their zone plan um, and to write their city plan that enabled them to zone. And so I have the correspondence between the cities and the planners. And basically what they're saying is we incorporated a subdivision on, you know, a private subdivision 10 years ago. We had race restricted deed covenants. Shelley versus Kramer says we can't have them anymore. What do we do? And the planning engineers would say, well, you zone in this way. This is how it works. And often the correspondence is quite explicit. How do we keep the black people out? So this is uh, St. Louis City and St. Louis County, circa 1948. The lighter yellow colors are the, are the larger lot, single family zones, which is considered the sort of ticket to maintaining segregation. Uh, the blues here um, are multifamily. The only blue you see there in the county is uh, Clayton and University City around uh, Washington University. This, and this gets more exclusive over time. One pattern then is what we conventionally call simply exclusive zoning, where you're trying to keep people out on the basis of income. So this is Ladue, Missouri in, the, in central St. Louis County. Uh, the lightest color are three acre lots. The others are an acre and a half. So these are very large, sort of the state-like uh, suburban planning. The only little bits of industry or commercial are where arterial streets might uh, cross the boundary. A better and in some respects more naked example of exclusionary zoning uh, is another famous St. Louis uh, real estate case, the Blackjack case from the 1970s. 
So blackjack, as you can see here, is an unincorporated pocket of the county in 1970. A Methodist congregation in the city uh, gets together with one in the county and goes to housing and urban development to do a section 235 development, a multifamily development, subsidized uh, with federal funds. And this is the proposal in the crosshatch there on the larger map. When the Neighborhood Improvement Association of Blackjack and Spanish Lake gets wind of the plans, within a space of six weeks, they incorporate as a town and slap a single family zone over the whole thing. This despite the fact that much of Blackjack has duplexes already built in it. They're just all zoned as non-conforming exceptions. And so again, the point is to sort of preempt, either preemptively or in the face of a threat, to use uh, the zoning as a way of, main, of maintaining uh, exclusive uh, single family uh, land use. And this, this is interesting because at the time between the 1940s and 1970s, the general assumption was that uh, exclusive single family land use was the best fiscal strategy as well, and that falls apart over time uh, for reasons that I'll explain. But anyway, for the moment, what they're simply trying to show is the way in which these private forms of restriction migrate into public policy, including zoning. And here's another uh, example of a pattern of zoning that you see in St. Louis County, which I would characterize as quarantine zoning. So the little red uh, uh, postage stamp there in the, in the uh, top corner is Elmwood Park, uh, an old free black African-American community established in the 1890s that exists in what will become suburban St. Louis long before the suburbs are there. This is all about an overland, uh, two municipalities that eventually come to sort of surround Elmwood Park and quarantine. And I can show you the way that works in this map. So the, the small dots which uh, that you see there are single family homes by the year in which they're built. The dark line are the uh, uh, current boundaries of overland and overland. But what I'll show you is the way in which, through a corporation of municipal incorporation and annexation, that the residential subdivision comes first, then it's annexed, and then it's zoned in such a way to effectively quarantine Elmwood Park. So 1920, we see more houses being built. In 1930, all of that is incorporated, although there's very little residential development at that point. 1939, Overland is incorporated. And then the towns grow by annexation, taking in essentially subdivisions that are built on private land or on unincorporated land, and then annexing them. 1950, 1955, and then in 1965, the last little pocket. But Elmwood Park remains unincorporated. None of the streets from all of that Overland go through. None of, this, none of the subdivision infrastructure goes through. Elmwood Park in 1965 trucks in its water, and most of the homes have outhouses. And then, to add insult to injury, all of that in overland zone, like this. So they surround Elmwood Park with industrial zone as a way of, as I suggest again, quarantining uh, it through, through uh, land use plan. Now the final piece of this with regard to the sort of broader uh, metropolitan uh, patterns is urban renewal, which in some respects is, uh, you know, at least on the face of it, designed to redress some of the damage done by segregation. In 1945, the city of St. Louis uh, defines this, what it calls a blighted area and an obsolete area, marking off large chunks of the residential north side again, largely for lack of indoor plumbing, for narrow streets and conditions like that, as blighted. The reason for this, of course, is to draw down federal money to do large-scale clearance and build things like the first Bush Stadium, the first convention center, that sort of thing. But what we see as a, fair, as a systematic pattern in this is that uh, African-American occupancy is defined as a kind of blight, something to be removed. While at the same time, there's a sort of bait and switch game going on because the conditions of the residential north side are used to qualify for the federal funds, but then the money is spent elsewhere. So in fact, when we look at the major Missouri programs, this is the sort of major redevelopment program. You can see it's all central business district, riverfront industrial development, but in fact, no money is being spent, no investment is being made on that, on that blighted residential footprint. 
Uh, this is the other sort of major program. This is a little bit misleading because you do see uh, these two large areas on the residential north, north side, but those aren't redevelopment areas, they're code enforcement areas, which actually do even more damage uh, in terms of, of driving disinvestment. Then we get the establishment of enterprise zones under both federal and Missouri law, and these are not particularly important for, uh, in terms of shaping uh, the city, but I draw your attention to these because they give a good example of the way in which economic development works in Greater St. Louis. So this is the uh, airport enterprise zone. And it looks like this. And it looks like a gerrymandered electoral district because that's precisely what it is. The enterprise zone is established in order to save a Ford plant in Hazleton, Hazelwood, Missouri, which is right here. The problem is that the enterprise zone program is the only economic development program at play which actually has criteria for you have to have a certain amount of poverty, a certain amount of unemployment, a certain amount of income inequality to uh, grant tax abatements for investment. Well, Hazleton doesn't qualify. So they wander all over North County until they get to Kinlock, Missouri, right next to Ferguson, where a critical mass of poor people live to qualify the entire zone as having sufficient unemployment, sufficient poverty uh, for investment. Of course, no investment is made in Kinlock. It's all made in the hope of saving the Ford plant which lasts another six years and then leaves in 1986. And then, once federal money is taken off the table, and you can't see this that clearly because I'm not getting my red, but these are TIF districts here in black. And tax increment financing uh, just subverts all of the logic of economic development because all the investment goes to the fringe because these are the municipalities that are in a position to play uh, the, ta the, uh, the tax increment financing game because it's a form of economic development in which you need a willingness to invest at, at, the, at the outset. Uh, and, and it's particularly exaggerated in the Missouri suburbs and in the St. Louis suburbs, because Missouri is one of the few states where you can tiff, that is, grab the, the increase in the tax, not only of property taxes, but also of sales taxes. And Missouri also has the distinction of having a very peculiar sales tax system in which municipalities can declare themselves what are called point of origin cities, which mean, means they get to keep all of the sales taxes they generate. So there's this, this huge uh, competition, this game of musical chairs in suburban uh, St. Louis of who can attract the next big box retail. There are about 30 Target stores in St. Louis County. The average lifespan of them is four and a half years before somebody builds another one, newer one, across a municipal line, usually within sight of the old one. Uh, Target more, owns more empty stores in St. Louis County than it does ones that it's actually operating. So, that's the big picture of, of these, these sort of perverse patterns of, you know, private segregation migrating into public policy and then into what I see, you know, as really a sort of fundamentally cynical pattern of economic development and urban renewal. So let's recenter that on Ferguson. So if we start with the larger story, I think with respect to understanding Ferguson, there are five important consequences of that story. And the first of those is a sort of dramatic disinvestment that you see in the city core. So this is what much of North St. Louis looks like now. The remaining houses sort of stick out like, uh, you know, like uh, teeth in, in, uh, in someone's mouth. You have block after block in which there is a single house or no houses whatsoever. You have census tracts in North St. Louis whose population peaked at 12,000 and now have eight, 500 people. This is a city that over the course of the last half century doesn't grow substantially in population. It goes from about a million and a half to a little over two million metro-wide, but its land area increases 12 times. It just thins out and at the expense of the central city. So this is Metro St. Louis in 1930. You probably can't read the number in, this, in the center, but the city has about two thirds of the population. And as we go forward, 1940, and you start adding counties to the metro area, this number, there you can see it. And the central city share just plummets. So by 1980, it's less than 20%. By 1990, it's 16%. By 2010, 11% of the region's population lives in the city of St. Louis. 
we can see that even more dramatically uh, in this example. So the little white postage stamp there in North St. Louis is a Sanborn fire insurance map, which gives you a sense of the density of development uh, on the north side. So it's a nice sort of figure ground drawing of um, how many houses there were, there's a school there, that sort of thing. But if we map on top of that the number of properties in which the buildings are gone, it looks like that. North St. Louis, you know, really empties out. If you, if you, you know, leave here and go to Google Earth and, and fly into North St. Louis, you could be flying into Yellowstone for the amount of green space that you see. The second important consequence that I would point out is this fundamentally uneven pattern of residential development, which is particularly important for understanding Ferguson. Because what we see, uh, and this is a sort of metro-wide version of the thing I showed you for Elmwood Park earlier, what you see if you track single home construction and patterns of municipal incorporation and annexation, you find by and large the single family construction comes first, often on a restricted basis, particularly before 1950, and the incorporation comes after the fact. So there's very little actual land use planning because all you're really doing is taking a subdivision and cementing it as a corporate municipality. This is why in St. Louis County, you know, most of the uh, municipalities have names like Town and Country Acres, you know, because they were originally subdivisions and they have those quaint uh, sort of names. So the yellow here are in areas are incorporated. So this is 1892. You can see, you know, Bridgeton. Uh, um, Pacific, these are along rail lines or they're ferry landings uh, that early on. But as we move forward in time and you begin to see, and there's Ferguson, which is incorporated in 1894, you start to see the single family home construction spread out into the county. But what you generally see, you know, is this pattern, a large amount of subdivision development, but prior to incorporation. And then the municipalities come later. Again, there are 94 incorporated municipalities in St. Louis County. That fragmentation is very important because each of those 94 municipalities have a, a subtly different strategy as to what sort of role they'll play in the segregation of the metro area. So some of the inner suburbs look more like the city itself. That's certainly true of Ferguson. Some of the outer ones, particularly in Central County, are very exclusive, you know, sort of three-acre lots uh, and that sort of thing. And so this depends a little bit on strategy and a little bit on timing. So here we see uh, these two views of the metro area. So this is the city. This, I'm just showing the county. It's not, again, I've lost my red here on the projector, so it's not quite as dramatic as it should be. But what I'm trying to show here is that in the inner suburbs, particularly in North County, the houses are much smaller and they're much older. They're more like the city than they are like what we would conventionally call a suburb. Um, particularly out into the central county. And that gives you a somewhat closer look. This is the footprint of the Ferguson Florissant School District. The third consequence, and you know what's important in a moment is the way I'll try and fit these together, is a substantial racial gap in wealth. And this is not peculiar to St. Louis, but it, it's particularly acute because of this pattern of land development. So we don't know that much about wealth because the data is not very good. Um, but this is the general pattern nationally from the survey of consumer finances. And so this is white wealth. Uh, black wealth is the red line. And this is the ratio of white to black. So you know, running counter to the broader civil rights revolution, things are actually getting worse. And if we look at, you know, compare uh, the ratio of wages, which is about three quarters, incomes is clo getting close to two thirds, the white to black ratio in wealth is under 10%. And that's all about housing. 80% of families, their wealth is in home equity. So what we're really you mean talking about. like the white ratio. Yeah, right. yeah. So what we're really looking at here is a, is a circumstance in which, not, in, first, first and foremost, African American families 
do not have access to that escalator of wealth creation created by the FHA, the GI Bill, and other um, federal programs in the 1930s and 1940s, because local restrictions uh, uh, prevent that. But, it, but it's not just the failure to accumulate equity to sort of tap into those subsidies, uh, and then, of course, pass that on to subsequent generations. What we also see in settings like St. Louis is that African-American properties are fundamentally devalued uh, by patterns of predatory lending, which cut across this period, by underzoning. So North St. Louis, for example, which has mostly built up a single-family zone, or family housing, is all zoned multifamily as early as the 1930s. And by that pattern of vacancy and disinvestment that I pointed out on the north side. So it's not like an African-American family is sitting in a house that just doesn't appreciate in value. They're sitting in a house that goes to a sheriff's sale eventually and loses all value in, in that pattern, fundamental pattern of vacancy that I pointed out. The fourth consequence then is really follows from the first three, and this is sort of pattern of displacement and relocation. Um, that is really in large part driven by the, by the disinvestment that we see on the north side, but also by public policy, by urban redevelopment, uh, and by the building of the urban highway system. Public policy pushes the population of St. Louis around in fundamental ways. By my estimate, one in 10 families in St. Louis are displaced by government action between 1950 and 1980. One in 10, and 80% of those are African American. So here is the first sort of major um, urban renewal project downtown, the clearance of the Mill Creek Valley. Um, so this is about the time the first Bush Stadium is built downtown. This is a heavily African-American neighborhood. Uh, St. Louis is uh, infamous for violating every standard that uh, the federal government throws up about relocation, basically um, cutting people loose. All of the families here move north and west into the city. The effect being that they're relocated from one swath of substandard housing to another. They put uh, stress on the housing stock of the north side, encouraging, as we'll see in a moment, uh, white flight. And the effect of government action is actually to harden local segregation. Because Kosciuszko, the other project which is largely white, those people move south, the African Americans move north. Many of the African Americans are, of course, warehoused in uh, big box public housing, the Pruitt Eagle projects, which are built at that time for that purpose. So that's sort of uh, one aspect of the sort of displacement. Not as important in terms of numbers, but I think in some respects more emblematic is what happens in St. Louis County. Because there are a string of old African American enclaves in the county that exist prior to conventional suburbanization. One of these, as we've already seen, is Elmwood Park. This is Elmwood Park in 1955. Uh, it's home to about 125 African American families. But, and conventional suburbanization comes out, as we saw, and it sort of goes around Elmwood Park like, you know, a rock in a stream, completely ignoring it. After which, of course, the county sort of turns around and says, that's blight because there's no plumbing, you know, there's a polio outbreak in Elmwood Park in 1962, uh, none of the streets go through. And so Elmwood Park, along with a number of other of these small African-American enclaves, are identified for redevelopment. In fact, the only redevelopment that the county engages in, in, in the federal uh, renewal era, <clears throat> consists of trying to wipe out these pockets of African-American settlement. So Elmwood Park is surveyed, these are the sort of uh, the, the properties that don't have indoor plumbing or have been vacated. There's a plan drawn which calves off about a third of the footprint of Elmwood Park for industrial use. And this, this is mid-development. You can actually see bulldozers if you look closely enough. Much smaller footprint. But more important for, for our purposes is where do the people go? Well, federal urban rule has a horrible record for relocation. Um, the federal law has no um, enforceable relocation standards until 1970, which is the very end of the renewal period. So although uh, the rules for the FHA at the time were 
if you're redeveloping for residential purposes, you have to give the people you're kicking out the first chance to come back in. This is what happens. One family moves back to Elmwood Park. One out of 125 families. Where do the rest go? Well, instead of, of when the uh, local land development authority goes door to door, instead of giving families a prospectus for what the new subdivision is going to look like, which is what they're supposed to do, they give them applications for Pro Ego downtown. So uh, some move into public housing, but more dramatically, they move into already segregated tracts of the city, including Kinlock, which is right next to Ferguson. Kinlock here. So Kinlock, this is the corporate municipality of Ferguson. Kinlock, is, as you'll see, is part of the Ferguson, Ferguson Florissant School District and uh, helps to define the sort of south uh, part of that district as largely African American. And then the final piece of this puzzle, the final consequence, is the population movement that results from all of this, from the collapse of the north side, from the very uneven pattern of residential development, from the racial wealth gap, from displacement as a result of government action. And that looks sort of like this. So each of these series of maps spans uh, two census years. So I'm showing here the change in the population between 1940 and 1950. Each dot on the map is 10 persons, white, black, or a decrease corresponding. You know, unfortunately, the white and, or the black and the red look the same but I can describe the general pattern. So what we see between 1940 and 1950, largely, is in-migration of African Americans for the war effort, uh, but confined heavily to North St. Louis because of all the race-restricted deed covenants of the systematic restrictions in the county. You can see pockets of African American settlement in the county, in Kinloch, in Elmwood Park, and in Meacham Park, uh, further south. And then you start to see a pattern of white flight out of the city at the same time. Part of this is there's in, in migration of whites between 1940 and 1950, particularly for the war effort, but they all end up here. And you also see in advance the um, accompanying the, the movement of African Americans in, particularly the north side, uh, whites are moving out. And then you begin to see sort of dramatic migration out of the city. African Americans moving again from the footprint of renewal projects into the north side, and whites largely uh, moving out. More of the same in uh, 1670. Then by, the, by the time we get to 1970, 1980, you can see that white flight has now largely become black flight. So all of these. Each of these represents 10 African Americans leaving the city, largely, again, uh, along this axis, as I'll explain in a moment. Eighty to 90, we'll just run to the present. And again, so here we really start to see the fundamental movement of African Americans across the county line out into what is outlined there, the footprint of the Ferguson Forest School District. This is Lamar Williams, first African American to move to Ferguson. Uh, bought this house uh, in 1970. And he's actually featured um, in a, a federal publication called Discrimination in Suburbia. He's the emblematic story that, that is the preface uh, for that volume published in the early 1970s. He gives testimony uh, at the 1970 hearings of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. And his purchase of that house, I think, nicely illustrates the sort of basic dynamics that I'm talking about. I mean, first of all, he leaves the city. He's an assistant school principal. And he leaves the city in that period of black flight because he has exactly the same motives, of course, as white families of leaving a dysfunctional uh, central city. And by 1970, in the wake of the Jones v. Meyer case, which is another St. Louis case, uh, post-Civil Rights Act, finally has the opportunity to sort of cross the county line.
But again, some of those background dynamics that I've been talking about, that uneven development and the race gap, play into that. Because Ferguson is one of the few communities that people like Lamar Williams can go to. It's an older suburb built in 1953, very modest by suburban standards, only 1,000 square feet, and a small lot. Ferguson is almost all 10,000 square foot or 5,000 square foot lots or multifamily housing. So all of those dynamics of, um, of uneven development, of the racial wealth gap, of dislocation as a result of government action, begin to converge on the inner suburbs. It becomes the only option uh, for uh, gentlemen or families like uh, the Williams family. And you get a pattern that looks a little bit like this. So a very stark north-south pattern of racial occupancy. So this is as of 2010 from Block Group did. This is what locals call the Del Mar Divide, because Del Mar is an avenue in St. Louis that you can stand on one side and see, you know, a stately Victorian mansion on the south side of the street that's worth three, four hundred thousand dollars, and on the north side of the street is exactly the same house built at exactly the same time that Zillow tells me is worth sixty thousand dollars. That's how stark the divide is. Let me see. And what you see is that in this period of flight, in this sort of larger pattern of population movement, whites, largely settling in South St. Louis, move to the southern and central suburbs. African Americans moving ahead of the urban renewal bulldozer, first into North St. Louis, and then out into North County. This pattern of flight is so substantial that, in fact, the majority of African Americans in Metro St. Louis now live in North County and not in the city itself. The city of St. Louis, uh, had a population of 860,000 at the 1950 census. It's now under 310,000. I'm sorry, what was the figure in the earlier year? 850. So St. Louis is, loses more of its central city population than any other American metro area over that time period. So the point being is that you know, when it becomes possible for African American families to leave, this is, this is the direction of migration from North City into North County, partly because of the, the power of that um, north-south divide, but also because, partly because this is, the, because this is a, um, a population with very limited uh, accumulated wealth and home equity, and this is the only footprint affordable housing in the county. So the Del Mar divide, that north-south line holds, but the line of segregation between city and county begins to fray. And then what happens, of course, is that all of the economic disadvantages that we associate with you know, the impoverished central city begin to migrate in exactly the same direction. So here, uh, the, what's showing on black on your screen is actually red, but it doesn't really matter. These are in these. Uh, census tracts, the population is earning less than 60%, less than two-thirds of the median wage for the metro area. So this is 1970. As we move forward, we begin to see that concentration of poverty, of income inequality, move out into St. Louis County. We can see much the same thing. Again, this is just uh, percent black by block group, so a version of the same map. But you can see, again, this, the across the metro area, here's the north-south line. But on the footprint of, of the Ferguson School District, we replicate that north-south line in some respect. The south part of Ferguson Florissant is, is largely multifamily, uh, much poorer, and much more concentrated in terms of African-American occupancy. And that's reflected in virtually every um, important demographic. Unemployment, much darker, again, along the swath of, of the north, inner north metro and across uh, south Ferguson floors. Uh, Female-headed households, the same thing. This is an index uh, HUD uses for poverty, which combines family poverty rates and public assistance rates. Again, all I'm really uh, interested in here is the variation uh, and, the, and the fact that you know, the dark, which is the bad rate, uh, occurs uh, so fundamentally on that, on that north-south axis, both within the metro and within Ferguson Florissant. Environmental health hazards, the same thing. This is another high index. 
labor market engagement, school proficiency, all the same. Much of this, I would argue, is driven, you know, by the by the sort of consequences that I, that I that I played out, the sort of wealth gap and the uneven development, but also fundamentally by the fragmentation, which becomes the sort of mechanism which. Um, by which you maintain segregation, sustain it over time, and then really can't overcome it. One of the interesting patterns you see here is that the school districts in St. Louis County begin to understand the problem. There are 88 school districts in St. Louis County in the 1940s. There's 23 today. They begin to consolidate because it doesn't make any sense. But the underlying municipal footprint doesn't change. So you have a school, print, uh, a school district like ferguson Florissant which contains 11 municipalities, but it, only but it only completely contains two of them. You have these bizarre sort of corporate lines. Normandy School District, which is down here, includes part of 25 municipalities. Because that underlying municipal uh, organization reflects the older pattern of segregation. One good illustration of that, which you can notice here, uh, is the relationship between Berkeley, Kinlock, and Ferguson. In the 1930s, there were two school districts. There was the Ferguson District, which is south of this line, and the Florissant, which was north of it. In 1937, the Ferguson District splits and into the, because the city of Berkeley incorporates in that year, and they incorporate in much the same pattern we saw elsewhere by surrounding Kinlock, the African-American neighborhood, dead-ending all of the streets, not extending their sewer lines, and then to add insult to injury, saying, we'd like two school districts now. So Kinlock becomes its own school district. And Berkeley, this sort of bizarre half-donut municipality, becomes the other district, which includes Ferguson. So Kinlock is a district right in the middle. It's 98% black. The rest of the district is 98% white. They're only stitched back together again uh, in 1970 as part of uh, St. Louis's protracted uh, school desegregation fund. This fragmentation yields, among other things, enormous fiscal stress. And what's important here, and it goes back to a point I made earlier, is that the strategy of uh, basing municipal incorporation on large or small lot single family housing, not only is a strategy of segregation, but is a strategy of uh, paying for city services, begins to fall apart. Because when most municipalities do this in the 40s and 50s, they're taxing property at its true value. But what happens in the sort of property tax revolution that begins in California in the 70s and comes to Missouri in 1980 with its Hancock Amendment is you start to see strategies by which states dampen property values. Either they don't let, let assessments rise, or they establish all sorts of ex exemptions, right? Homestead credits, uh, circuit breakers, uh, things like that, which, which depress the ability of, munis of these municipalities to gain revenues through the property tax system, particularly if you're stuck with smaller houses, because that's lots of kids in the schools but, and less revenue, um, and single family footprint. So what I show here, again, the sort of fiscal stress is partic particularly acute in these dark areas where local revenues raise you know, under $5,000 per student. But what's also notable is look at the local tax levy for schools. The tax levy is highest in the high-stress uh, districts because, you know, these are districts that can't raise the money. They push their levy to the limit allowed by the state. So not only, you know, do, your kid, do the kids in Ferguson go to lousy schools, but their parents pay a much higher property tax rate than those who go to schools in the central county where 94% of the funding is coming from local revenues at a tune of $18,000 a student. This also, you know, infamously in the St. Louis case, leads to this pattern of revenue policing, whereby in the absence of property tax revenues, you rely on court costs instead. And so this is from the report by One St. Louis, which sort of traced the reliance across North County. And as you can see, Ferguson and Berkeley, these are not uh, outliers in any respect. Some of these municipalities, Bell Nor, Bell Ridge, uh, get over 80% of their local revenues uh, by finding kids. It's a very interesting dynamic, which again, I think, is attenuated by the fragmentation. 
because St. Louis, like a lot of cities, is, is marked by uh, a fundamental mismatch between where people live and where they work. So none of the kids who live in Ferguson, none of the young men and women who live in Ferguson work in Ferguson. They migrate, they commute through the suburbs in order to do that. But of course, when you have such a fragment uh, um, structure, you're sort of exposing yourself to 27 municipal police forces on your morning drive and on your drive back. Uh, and in, and you know, in fact, it becomes a huge source of revenue. The, one of the ironies here is that most of these municipalities are too small to have their own police forces. So they contract with the county. But the county allows them to slap their own name on the side of the police car. So you have the police force of Bel Nor, which has two cars. It's really just the St. Louis County Sheriff. But you know, you could get a ticket for a, for a busted taillight here, 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 and then on the way home again. And they're, you know, these sort of stories are rife. You know, it's important to recognize, again, you know, that fundamentally these municipalities, this fragmentation exists to sustain segregation. This is why the municipalities are created, in order to sustain patterns of land use and subdivisions. They're not created with any thought to providing services, and many of them are too small to do so. Champ, Missouri, which is right here, is six houses and 13 people. The state of Missouri has no you know, regulatory control, no attempt at regulatory control over the creation of new municipalities until the late 1970s, when it was too late. And so you have a pattern in these municipalities, particularly in the path of racial transition, of also sort of fundamental inequality in the provision of basic services. And we can go back to uh, Lamar Williams for a good example of this. He says in his testimony to the Civil Rights Commission in 1970 that, you know, the moment he moved in and other African-American families started moving into the neighborhoods, you know, stuff started to go downhill. They didn't pick up the garbage as often. We now have the most inadequate lighting in the city. I can't recall the streets being clean. But he does add, I think we've got more police protection than required when I first moved here. I don't know if they're protecting me or protecting someone from me. This is 1970. So the basic pattern is this. You have this a pattern of local housing segregation which is systematically organized um, around <coughs> this chain of mechanisms that begin in private discrimination and then migrate and are reinvented in forms of public policy, all with very much the same uh, motive in mind. So they move from policy to policy, from uh, racial zoning to deed covenants to forms of mortgage finance to zoning to urban renewal. And this has, I think, you know, three fundamental consequences. It impoverishes African Americans uh, in greater St. Louis by shutting them off from, again, that escalator wealth creation. It leads to that fundamentally uneven pattern of residential development, so the affordable housing outside the city is heavily concentrated in the inner suburbs. And it leads to that, uh, those um, patterns of population movement driven in part by urban renewal, driven in part by the decline of uh, the central city, and driven in part by the thin opportunity provided by the civil rights revolution in property law, which finally allows gentlemen families like the Williams family to cross the county line uh, into settings like Ferguson. But in the process, it creates these very uh, unsettled zones of racial transition moving across uh, North County. And that, I think, is the sort of underlying uh, and root cause of the disturbances that we saw uh, beginning last August in Ferguson. Uh, Questions? Yeah. Is it true that uh, police officers get promoted in accordance with the number of traffic um, fines and the rest they make? Yeah, I mean, the, the Department of Justice report that came out, what, a couple of months ago, you know, really added some pretty dismal color to, mm -hmm. you know, just the numbers in terms of, uh, um, you know, the explicit racism in internal communications and those you know, those background patterns. And, and all of these municipalities in different ways work on an incentive system. Um, I mean, this is, this is one small part of it which will change. I mean, the state is going to crack down on the municipal court system. It it's, is important to note, and, and you know, I don't think we should be completely distracted by this sort of 
overt racism in the, of the Ferguson case because south of Ferguson in Normandy and Wellston and other inner suburbs where the transition is further along and the leadership of the city council and the bulk of the police forces are African American, they do the same thing. That's how they raise the money. Who benefits from this, the way this is played out? Good question. Um, <laughs> I mean, in one respect, it's it's just a you know a bizarre sustained collective action problem in which no one benefits. I mean, the city as a whole is worse off as a result. But because of the nature of municipal fragmentation in St. Louis County, there's always a sort of critical mass who think that they might be the winners in this game of you know musical chairs or whatever. We see that in economic development and attracting big box retail. We see that in the effort of all of these municipalities to become. Are, you know, all of them begin as bastions of white flight. People coming out of St. Louis, erecting restrictive deed covenants and saying, okay, finally now we're safe, but, you know, it, it doesn't last. Mm -hmm. And there have been efforts about one generation to put St. Louis City and St. Louis County back together again. Because one of the things that makes this particularly difficult as a sort of uh, governance problem is the city of St. Louis is also a county. It's its own county. And that's one of the reasons why very early on you can get municipalities right on its border because they're in a different county and the rules are different. But every time that's happened, a slightly different arrangement of local municipalities and local interests had said, no, we don't want consolidation. So early on, the county wants nothing to do with it, but neither do African Americans on the north side because it will dilute what little political power they have. Now it's really more a matter of the inner suburbs in the county want consolidation, but the outer suburbs don't. One of my favorite exercises from this came, I'll just try and get back to a, a basic map of the city. When this came up in the 1980s, uh, one of the planners sitting there at you know, one of these meetings between the Board of Freehold and the Board of Aldermen, trying to decide how to do this, doodled on his legal pad his solution, which involved uh, reorganizing the municipalities as if you were at the South Pole. So they all started here and radiated out into the county. Right? Everyone had a slice of the pie. So everyone got a little piece of a rusted out steel mill on the riverfront, a little bit of older central city housing or the central business district, a little bit of the inner suburb, and then a lot of the outer suburb. And then you say, pay for your schools, pay for your police. How would you do it? And that's really the, you know, captures, I think, the essence of your question of, of the winners and the losers. One of the reasons I think that everyone loses, but you haven't been able, but no one's, but we haven't been able to overcome that, um, is the background fragmentation and the fact that who the winners and who the losers are or think they are keeps changing, and so they, um, it's very resistant to a solution. Yeah, I have two unrelated questions. The first is uh, the role that deindustrialization. Uh, play, especially since since the 70s in accelerating, as you, you mentioned just now, the Rust Belt, uh, Riverfront, and so on. Uh, second is you haven't mentioned East St. Louis. Yeah, I was thinking of And that historic connectedness. Right. Uh, uh, of course, East St. Louis being this intensely segregated uh, industrial slum since since the beginning of the period you, you, you're talking about. That. Right. So, um, yeah, both very good questions. Certainly one of the important background conditions here, the reason why St. Louis is not and will never be a Renaissance city, is the background economic troubles. In fact, city planners in St. Louis are talking about deindustrialization as early as 1918, because it's a river-based economy, it's a 19th century economy, they're in trouble. So, you know, there are, there are um, pockets of hope, uh, you know, as a, a trucking dispatch center, there's a sort of boom and bust economy around Lambert Field, with Donald Douglas and, other, and others, but, but you're right, the industrial has hit St. Louis hard. It's sort of Milwaukee-like in, in that respect. And it makes it much harder to then overcome any of these background problems, because you don't have, you don't have the, uh, the, the, you know, the infusion of investment that you might rely on. What, what follows from that as well is that the leadership of the local business community across all of this is a business. Uh, St. Louis is dominated by a number of private firms, most of whom 
uh, take a sort of regional view of the economy, that is, they don't care where their stuff is. And this, so the early pattern is you put your corporate headquarters here, and you know you put the packing houses and the steel mills on the Illinois side. That's one pattern. Then uh, all of the local chambers of commerce join together in the 1970s and say, we'll just have a regional commerce association. And the result is that on the, on the back of deindustrialization, you get plants that start to leave the west side of St. Louis and the inner suburbs for the outer suburbs. The Chamber of Commerce doesn't care, as long as they're in the metro area. But again, it does sort of great damage. So the, you know, the background economic troubles are very important. The East St. Louis side is, yeah, it's a very interesting part of the story. Uh, my book deals with East St. Louis a little bit more because you know, my focus here was at Ferguson, I was sort of moving west, but with some limits. And those limits are this. Uh, first of all, you know, states set the terms by which municipalities organize themselves and, and set the rules. The rules on the Illinois side are very different. So in many respects, it's a different story. A different economic development strategies. Uh, you know, all of the east side of the river very early on is an enterprise zone, a tip zone. You know, and there, are, there are no properties on the east side of the river that aren't taxed, abated by the early 1970s to the point where the city gets in all sorts of trouble for using enterprise zone funds to pay their police, you know, in the early 1970s. You know what um, so it's a much more complicated story, although it is, you're right, part of the metro area. The other limitation for me as an historian is that, you know, I relied very much on the archival record to put this story together. And the east side is so dysfunctional so early that there is no archival record. There's nothing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you do see, there. it does come into the story at important points. I mean, for example, the profusion of race restricted deed covenants on the north side um, both stemmed from the failure of the zoning ordinance in 1916, but also from the race drive on the East St. Louis side, um, which people talk about explicitly as, as, as an important uh, I'm sorry, one, one follow-up question. Um, in, in your portrait here, you don't have African Americans as actors, mm -hmm. right? How does the civil rights movement of the 50s, 60s play into play into this? Is there are there mobilizations in, in St. Louis? I assume there were, in, yeah. the, in terms of accelerating white flight, etc., and intensifying the racism. St. Louis is not um, it's not a hotbed of civil rights actors. Partly because black flight is already beginning. So uh, it, as early as the 1950s, the, the north side is already uh, deeply suffering. Um, it has, in, in, in many respects, an older African-American community, well established before the First World War, an older sort of middle class community in the bill, which is uh, uh, about here. But what we see is you know, that movement of population in response to all the pressure I talked about is so dramatic that it really undermines the political mobilization of African Americans. There's some ward-based organization in the city. But civil rights organizations are always fighting against, you know, where, where are our people? You know, they're moving around, they're moving in and out. One contemporary example of that, which, you know, makes organizing African American organizing in the city difficult, is the role of the churches. Because all the African Americans now live here. They all go to church at mega churches in the city. So the churches are not in the community where they live, and uh, you know, and there are not a population in the vicinity of the churches. So the political role of the churches declines very dramatically with black flight. Uh, so you know, it's a complicated story. I will, you know, cop to being a sort of soulless social scientific historian. Um, there is there are a couple of good books on civil rights in St. Louis. Grassroots at the Gateway by Clarence Lang is a, is a good read. Um, as is uh, George Lips's book, uh, Ivan Perry and the Culture of Opposition. Yeah. Um, so, a couple of questions and a few comments. Um, one, I, I grew up in St. Louis, so I'm very familiar with this. Okay. Um, and I grew up in Olivet, so I'm also very familiar with Elmwood Park. And, and I'm just curious, you know, after Ferguson, too, just how does these kind of, this kind of narrative become a part of public discourse? Uh, I mean, the question about winners and losers, obviously for me, it just seems like white homeowners are a true winner in terms of property values, whatever. Um, and, and I think, too, 
um, you know, the piece about school debt segre desegregation, um, a lot of the schools, particularly with the lower tax levies, from my own personal experience, are the ones that are having uh, particularly African American students go to those schools the most. Mm -hmm. um, so those bo those bodies physically are a price, they're, they're a commodity that's being relocated and those outer suburbs are benefiting monetarily significantly. Um, and one of the conversations that I knew growing up, particularly when I talk about public discourse, is that a lot of the decline is, is discussed within, you know, the, the issues of personal behavior and or the folks, when they moved in, it went down. And so then I'm, I'm curious too, what kinds of analysis of class are, are you talking about? Particularly think about Lamar Williams as an assistant principal. He, you know, and, and the, the groups that are moving out to the suburbs really are people, middle class. You know, I think the misunderstanding too, like not necessarily Ferguson, which I'm not as familiar, but I'm familiar with Normandy. There's a lot of black middle class folks moving out there steady jobs, whatever, that school district collapse, that's where Michael Brown is going to school, right. um, becomes kind of a state-ran school. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's definitely a public misconception of who is going to these schools and whose are the homeowners. Um, and yeah, so I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think your point about you know, winners and losers and the homeowners is a very good one because the way I would describe it is yeah, unbalanced white homeowners who accumulate the equity, um, who move in stages further west of the city, are the big winners. The losers, in respect, are, um, let, me, let me back up. So the segregation, in that sense, is fairly systematic. But I would also say, across St. Louis, it's also spatially unstable. So you have, you know, Ferguson was developed as a bastion of white flight. It's where the white working class went out of North St. Louis. Um, and you know it's now 67% African American, blackjack, Spanish like uh, the same thing. So it becomes very difficult on the north side, particularly in these small postage stamp municipalities with more modest patterns of residential development, to sustain that segregation over time. And it becomes it becomes very unstable, um, particularly you know, and that and that transition is going on today. So you know it's interesting. You look at a setting like Ferguson. And you know, you just look at a sort of dissimilarity index, and you say, "Man, it's an integrated community." I would not describe it that way, right? It's it's going it's going through a uh, dramatic transition, particularly if you consider, you know, the north-south pattern. So you know, in, in here you have larger single-family homes, but here along Moline Creek through South Ferguson and Kinlock, it's all apartment buildings, right? And, and they're virtually the only large-scale apartment buildings in St. Louis County are, are along that stretch. So you have to sort of, you know, I would characterize in the big picture what happens here as, you know, marked by <clears throat> simultaneous success and failure of, of segregation. Um, you know, as we know from um, patterns of blockbusting in the inner cities, there's no greater damage than when a segregation scheme falls apart, right, because of a sort of dramatic change in, in property value. The school stuff is um, is very complicated. Um, you know, St. Louis, St. Louis is a very funny setting because uh, it doesn't dig dig, dig in its heels in 1954. Uh, initial desegregation is fairly calm, um, but you know the core legal battle goes on today, and and it's largely uh, reflected in the fact that you have a single school district in the city, which very early on is identified as an African American district. Because the white kids on the south side all go to parochial schools, so the city is, con you know, the city school district is considered heavily African American. And then you have these pockets, as I described, around Kinlock and, and Ferguson, where you get the sort of intense segregation of, of schools, you know, between the late 1930s and the early 1950s, and then that necessarily comes apart with Brown versus the Board of Education. But then you go through this endless cycle of moving kids around, of decertifying and certifying schools. Uh, or, 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 or entire districts, as in the case of Normandy. Um, and so the moving pieces there are just, you know, as you identify, tremendously um, sort of complicated and, and um, you know, unsettling in terms of, of the larger picture. I feel like I left 
part of the class problem. differences among African Americans? Yeah, yeah. So, so what you see, you know, in some respects, is a is a pretty dramatic instance of the pattern that you know William Julius Wilson pointed out: the fracturing of the African American community because it is the middle class uh, that could leave. Um, you know, by the 1970s, it's a modest middle class to be sure, but it is people like Lamar Williams, assistant principals, that are moving out of North St. Louis and are able to move into the county, uh, that are able uh, to buy homes. Yes, yeah, so I have sort of three interrelated questions. I think it's the same as possible. Um, so I'm wondering if you've seen like Ben Immergook's work on uh, using home uh, mortgage disclosure act data, linking race on census tract level with subprime and uh, predatory lending. Because I'm wondering sort of what are the current role of sort of banks uh, in this process, particularly bank repossessions. Um, I'm also interested in uh, how gentrification uh, fits into this in any way at all. I'm less familiar with St. Louis than other other areas. And then finally, um, based off all this work, because this is a tremendous amount of archival research that went into this, uh, so I definitely commend you there. I, I'm just curious, what, how do you feel about this concept of repar reparations? And what is there sort of, is there, you know, as a possible solution, a remedy of sort, is, is, is the state owned uh, populations uh, something based off of all this? Um, well, I mean, I can't speak to the political feasibility of reparations, but, you know, I would say that if you're going to make the case, you make it on the case of state action in housing. Because it, it's a much stronger, more direct, and I think tangible case than, than linking it to, you know, to slavery um, and, and its, uh, and its act. So yeah, I would say, yeah, that, that's the source of the, of the wealth gap. In fact, you know, if you look more closely at, at the home ownership rates, you, you actually see the gap between white and black home ownership rates narrow substantially between the, from the beginning of the 20th century into the 1930s. And then when the FHA, HOLC comes online, they start to widen, particularly um, in the younger age cohorts, the 25 to 34, you know, when people are getting established. So, you know, I, I think it's important to emphasize that you're not just talking about the rate at which African Americans buy homes or their access to FHA loans, but when they buy them in their life cycle, what the, what the terms that they buy them under are. So for example, if we go back to, the, you know, if we went back to the FHA map, it's a, it's a misconception, I think, that a lot of people have that when you, when you mark those areas as red or yellow, that there are no loans in Because there are loans, they're just at much worse terms. Um, Amy Hillier's work on Philadelphia does a really nice job of pointing this out. Um, the 1950 census actually has, um, uh, mortgages by tract by the source of the mortgage. You can map FHA mortgages, and you see a lot of them are in the red areas, but they also have the interest rates, and they're two points higher. Um, so the, the pattern of predatory lending is, um, you know, it's not just a consequence of financial deregulation. It's really systematic across this period. Um, hard to get insurance, um, much higher rates. You know, in a sense, when the home mortgage stuff comes online in 75, maybe, you know, it's, they can only describe damage that's already been done. Um, and so we do have a little bit more systematic data from 75 to the present. But, you know, in much the same pattern, you don't really know if access to federal subsidies or access to mortgages on, on dismal terms are um, helping a neighborhood or hurting it. And we see that on the Section 235 program in HUD very early on. Um, that often is just used to tip neighborhoods from black to white. Uh, and you certainly don't see, you know, in that, in the, in the little infusion of federal money and, and subsidy that we do see in uh, North St. Louis, it's not sustained at all. I mean, I'm in the, the early stages of a project now, which is trying to use archival housing values to actually see what happens over time, because we, we don't have a good sense of, you know, what happens at a local level to the value of the house. But I think it's certainly true that um, you know in most of those North St. Louis um, blocks, you see uh, the value not only flatlined compared to what's happened in the suburbs, but often just sort of fall, go to zero. Sell these houses at this rate with these kinds of 
problems to this group of people, and then maybe right across, like you said, across one line, one street, the the housing costs go up a lot higher. Do they make money on both ends? I mean, it seems like if there's this kind of white flight, black flight going on, that the other winners would be the real estate um, associations and the real estate people. Um, and then the second question I have is that I read today that Brown's family is suing the city. Um, and I just wondered if more people in this area who are, you know, confronted with these kinds of issues, you know, if they began to pursue answers in court, whether some of this would change in any way. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, um, I mean, St. Louis is not a setting in which we see sort of dramatic and cynical blockbusting of the kind that, you know, benefits real, realtors on, on both ends. But I would say, you know, going back to this, even to 1916, that the real estate, uh, organized real estate agents are critical to the story. Because they're the ones that are really driving the policy pieces. They're the ones that write the FHA guidelines in the 1930s. And they're the ones, even as Shelley versus Kramer, uh, and, and other um, civil rights victories reduce their ability to overtly discriminate, continue to do so. It's no accident that St. Louis is the site of Shelley versus Kramer, which outlaws restricted deed covenants. It's a site of Blackjack, which is the first restrictive or exclusive zoning case. And it's a site of Jones v. Meyer, which takes place in North County, which is the case that finally applies the Civil Rights Act to private real estate transactions. Those are all St. Louis cases. It's sort of ground zero for civil rights and property. And you know, one thing which I explore more in the book and didn't talk much about today is as that jurisprudence progresses, you continue to see a fairly naked um, a pattern of uh, systematic steering by real estate agents. So there's a, you know, freedom of residence committees that document this by sending black and white couples with identical incomes and identical jobs to see where they're sent. And in fact, you see this systematic sorting along this north-south line, uh, particularly in the county, where a family will be sent here or here, depending on the county. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, I just had a question in terms of how much of the white community in the greater St. Louis is knows this story, or if there is a reaction response to your work, or is there a conversation going on with the greater St. Louis community about this history? Number one, uh, and number two, what would if you had like your magic wand, what would be some policy prescriptions to kind of undo and repair the, the all this uh, damage for, for all these decades? I like the magic wand. <laughs> um, that was my question, so I'll withdraw okay. mine. Okay. So I mean, first of all, on you know, I, I've done <coughs> versions of this talk. Um, maybe 40 times in St. Louis. And the, res the response is interesting. Um, people are very eager to sort of, to disavow their role in it while admitting the underlying patterns. So, you know, that's the story of my family. My parents moved from here to here to here, but. Um, so, you know, in a, local, in a St. Louis audience, I often sort of hasten to, or, or make a point to emphasize the fact that white flight does not necessarily imply overt racism. What it implies is a sort of structural opportunity, which is only enjoyed by white families. So I would make the argument, you know, based, and this is, you know, borne out by some great sociological research that was done in the 1970s, and Lamar Williams is a testament to that, that all families with kids in the schools or with the concern about local safety wanted out of North St. Louis, which was a failed uh, chunk of the city you know, beginning in the late 1950s, much more fundamentally in the 1960s. White families had the opportunity to leave earlier, and so you get a generation of white flight, and then you get a generation of black flight. So, it, so you know, that's the sort of, the soft landing that I can provide to a sort of local white audience to say, well, it's just, you know, it's the way in which opportunities are structured. It doesn't necessarily speak to anyone's individual motives. Um, the other response I often get, I got this on a radio show I was doing in Columbia, Missouri, where the host turned to me and said, you know, St. Louis never struck me as a segregated city. And the reason is, people don't cross these lines. And, you know, so I gave a talk at St. Louis Community College, which is in the sort of central city, to a group of kids who had grown up in St. Louis. None of the white kids had ever been north of Delmar, of like 40 kids in the room, ever. 
the magic wand story are part of it. Um, part of it, I think, goes back to you know the the, the apocryphal solution of the pie shaped slices that go from the roof. So you know, and this is uh, very familiar to Joe. It's a sort of metro solution. So if you think about the city as a more of an organic entity, economically and demographically, uh, and think about running it on that basis. There are things we do metro-wide. So you have a sewer district, because the sewer district, you know, has to respect, you know, the sort of natural boundaries, creek beds, uh, that sort of thing. And it simply doesn't make sense on, on any efficiency grounds, you know, to have uh, the pipe with the shit in it stop and start at every one of these municipalities. People recognize that. Um, the same is true of transportation, because, you know, you can't draw down federal money for transportation unless you have a regional transportation agency. And so you think about these things, uh, where you build your light rail, where you build your highways, on a regional-wide basis. It's not a big leap intellectually, although it is a big leap politically, to think about doing the same thing with zoning and economic development. I mean, if all you did was said that the Federation of Local School Boards had a veto power on any local TIF, you would dramatically change the pattern of economic development in the area. But as long as each individual municipality gets to make that decision with no respect to what impact it has on the region, you know, it's, it's this bizarre game of musical chairs in which, you know, everybody is competing for, um, what is, you know, sick people fighting for each other's medicine, and um, everybody ends up worse, worse off because you, you, you know, if you're the CEO of Target, you look at this, you say, I want 30 stores in Metro St. Louis. And you end up with 30 stores, and none of them are paying taxes. So, you know, obviously, metro-wide. Um, and, you know, the other things, uh, the other examples that I would add to that were things like, you know, pooling the school taxes uh, on the sort of uh, Twin Cities model. Um, certainly, if you, if you simply got rid of the point-of-origin tax system and said everybody was in the same sales tax pool, you dramatically changed the local incentives. So I think, you know, it's a matter of scaling up local policy so that the political, uh, so that the, the public policies match the footprint of the economy and of, of the demographic unit that is the city. One follow-up question? Sure. Is there any movement to reincorporate, like reabsorb people, collapse boundaries and like kind of create greater municipal boundaries? No, they talk about it all the time. Um, <coughs> And, you know, it's coming up again in response to the Ferguson thing. They're talking in a very narrow way now about just doing it with the municipal courts and having some sort of revenue sharing system that would drop that incentive to uh, police local kids in that way. But again, you, you know, it, it's this, this collective action problem. We have 94 municipalities, you know, all of whom are losing collectively and 14 of them which think they can win. It's a different 14 depending on what year you're talking about, but they're enough to scuttle, you know, any serious action. I was just wondering if you've looked at this elsewhere in the country, because I know this is a big problem in New Jersey, too, <coughs> um, where any group of homeowners can get together and claim a municipality to stop paying local taxes. And I, you know, I, there's been a big push there to avoid this municipality structure and move to the ca a county structure, and it's, it's gone back and forth. But I was just wondering if you, what you've seen around that. Um, yeah, I think you're exactly right. Um, that, that you know, my favorite line, which I can't remember where it comes from, somebody said it in 1970, you know, St. Louis is uh, like a Eugene O'Neill play. It shows a general condition in a stark and dramatic form. And, you know, that, and that goes for every aspect of this. So race relations are starker in St. Louis. You know, it's a border city with population unleavened by in-migration. Uh, fragmentation is worse in St. Louis than almost anywhere else because of the lack of rules. Um, Midwestern cities generally, you know, have this ability to sprawl that older cities don't. Um, so I've looked at it, you know, generally in terms of placing St. Louis in a larger story. But in order to, you know, you really have to drill down into the details to understand what's going on because the rules of municipal incorporation or what amounts to home rule in a given state is set by that state. So, you know, different Corporate fragments have different powers. In some states, counties are much more powerful, and so a county can exert control over the municipalities within it. 
So, you know, one of the common explanations for the renaissance of Pittsburgh, for example, is the role that Allegheny County plays. Pittsburgh is entirely within Allegheny County. And in Pennsylvania, counties have much more substantive authority than they do in a setting like St. Louis. Um, so it varies a lot, um, not only by the state context, because that sets your sort of legislative uh, parameters, but also by the, you know, in this response to an earlier question, the, the economic health of the metro area you're talking about. Um, so no, I haven't looked at it systematically anywhere else, but I, you know, I have a general sense of where Philadelphia, or where St. Louis fits in that story. Any other questions? Yeah, I think we're just about out of time, so okay. thank you very, very much. Thank you. Yeah. Very, very much.